Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are participating to this webinar tonight. Tonight in Italy, of course, I'm Monica Bomba. I'm a member of the Italian Psychoanalytical Society. And my task is to moderate this webinar organized by the IPA Communication Steering Committee webinar coordinator, Mariano Rupertus. Uh, this webinar is part of the On the Road to the Cartagena Congress webinar series, and it's entitled Psychoanalysis and Gender. We have two outstanding guests who will present their papers today, Yuma Bazak and Jana orovitz Sandmeyer. I will present them later. And the, the theme of the today webinar is addressed by these two uh, panelists in from two different vertexes, but it's um, concentrated on the topic of women's thinking and individuality development. Um, so both Jana and Yuma a uh, starting point is the description of the social and cultural context they belong to, and both describe the condition of womanness in two apparently very distant societies, the Indian and the North American. So before starting the panel, I will explain briefly how the webinar is divided. So the first part uh, is uh, the, the first panelist will be uh, Yuma Bazak, who will present her paper, and then Jana Horowitz and Meyer. Then there will be a part of discussion between the panelists, and then uh, the Q&A section. For all the attendees, the Q&A um, sec section um, will work like this. You can. Uh, actually write and post your questions uh, in the question box uh, in the zoom bar in the bottom zoom bar since the very beginning of the webinar and we will collect the questions and um, there will be uh, uh, they will be answered in the end of the presentation so when Jana and Yuma will finish they will reply to the questions so uh, now we are ready to begin. I will present uh, the first panelist, who is uh, Dr. Yuma Bazak. Yuma is a training and supervising psychoanalyst of the Indian Psychoanalytical Society and member of the I International Psychoanalytical Association. She holds a PhD in psychology from the Kyushu University, Fukuoka, Japan. And Bazak pursued her interest in psychoanalysis with specific emphasis in culture, women, and gender. She has international publications in journals and books translated into different languages like Japanese, Italian, French, and so on, along with papers presented at various international IPA congresses over the last 20 years. She is the co-editor of the book Psychoanalytic and Social Cultural Perspective on Women in India, published by Taylor and Francis Group. And she is the editor of Sculpting Psychoanalysis in India, Sudhir Kakar, impressed now with Oxford. Bazak has been the past co-chair of Asia Co-op IPA Committee which is the Committee on Women and Psychoanalysis from 2017 to 2021, and organized the first two co-op international conferences in Calcutta, India in 2018 and 2019. Currently, she is a consultant of the, of the co-op and member of the IPSO and IPA Relations Committee. Bazak, offers lectures in psychoanalysis and psychology in different universities of India and conducts workshop with NGOs and at other social platforms. She has her own private clinical practice in Calcutta and is associated with a private hospital and clinic in Calcutta. 
She is the founder of Mira Center for Innovation, working on mental health, arts, and education in the community. So Yuma, now uh, she will present the paper entitled The Lost Feminine in the Maternal and Indian Query. Please, Yuma, take the floor. Thank you so much, Monica, for <clears throat> your kind introduction. And I thank uh, the organizing committee of IPA. Um, here we have Mariano, Santina, and others who have helped us to be together this evening. And with that, um, I begin my paper, The Lost Feminine in the Batala and Indian Query, Social Context and Abjection in Separation Individuation. Most often for the Indian woman, the family acts as the pivotal point of a sacrificial entity. The choice of the adult self in asserting her psychological independence from the community, standing distinct from the overbearing, smothering family and community instructions that she often grows up with, is a very difficult pathway to attain. In other words, the new Indian woman is carving out a new identity of her own, independent of preceding references of subjugation to family and community coercion. The nuances of cultural values merged with this makes it all the more difficult for the woman to identify and choose otherwise. The emerging woman's aspiration entails an evolving ego that is free from community despotism while engaging in the pathway of separation individuation in search of autonomy identity, but not necessarily devoid of effective bonding. This pathway to individual identity for the Indian woman is not necessarily a struggle to grow out of the mother per se, but rather from the filial bondage and community servitude that is culturally induced, which is as it is a much larger phallic construct within which both the mother and the daughter feel trapped in their various performative gendered social roles. Thus breaking away from this expected cultural norm may impose huge amount of guilt, isolation, minority treatment for the gone astray other woman, other independent woman from both within her family, in immediate family members, as well as from society at large. This angst for emancipation in today's woman is often looked upon as a negative Western influence that washes away the good Indian woman's cultural values. The price for the choice of this freedom may not may often entail isolation and abjection of the woman from her family and community life, leading to her solitary psychic and peripheral social journey. Both the mother and the daughter seem to be bound by their shared lack of the semiotic in their early infant stage and their growing up to be a woman from a girl child, subsequently followed by perhaps a covert longing, a surreptitious fantasy for the same dyadic semiotic merging. This lack may continue to seep into the Oedipal phase for the woman as her active desire for the mother is most often denied. It is not seen or registered by the mother and thus remains as an unrecognized desire, Diane Elise, 2020. And that may subsequently leave the woman's sexuality severely affected. This disavowal may quietly appropriate itself as the very basis for the foundation of identification with each other in order to become the combined voice of resistance against misogyny. While on the other hand, in continuation of the sexual discourse, this very lack as experienced in both the dyadic and the Oedipal phases of desires may provoke longing for the same may hold potential in the adult woman's future sexual conquest as an inherent insidious aspect in her quest for sexual claims in both her erotic and romantic fantasies. However, this does not imply the often misreading and pathologizing of the pre oedipal fixation of the infantile merger with the mother. The possible recognition of the sexual claims of the girl child's active desire for her mother, inclusive of both eros erotic Semiotic, somatic, dyadic, oedipal may have significant qualitative vicissitudes in both heterosexual and lesbian female development, sexuality and gender now. The sexual claim of the individual woman's right to bodily pleasures, her desires, her sexual partner, 
redefining love and sexuality for the woman altogether holds a more rebellious flavor. This emerging new woman in India claims her self-agency in making her declaration of her sexual choice. This may imply shaking grounds for traditional notions of propriety, culture, and family in India. The question is, does this woman ever get to address this deep void in her intrapsychic well, or would she forever be projected, enforced as a counter-reaction formation to become goddess Durga of every Indian household, fighting the big bad phallic world with her ten hands as the all-encompassing phallic mother of every of every family community. Does this constructed life goddess ever get to enjoy her nascent days, being the recipient of care and tenderness? Or does the feminine have to be oppressed, throttled in its culture in order to deal with the aggressive Oedipal duels of the phallic world, especially in a conflicting modern Kamarkic locale like India? Perhaps this is why there is a cultural need to worship goddesses in India, a glorious imagination of an aspirational, all-encompassing, protective phallic mother, while in actuality, the feminine is considered to be degrading, and thus in reality, the feminine is stifled in every household of India. Bisexuality and sexual split in women. In the paper, Primary Maternal Oedipal Situation, Diana Lees elaborates on the mother's heterosexuality, saying, Quote, if it does not incorporate a healthy integration of homoerotic desire, psychic bisexuality, that can be comfortably acknowledged and expressed, expressed in relating to a daughter, can lead to a primal rejection of the girl, of her genitals, and of her sexual power to attract the one she desires, unquote. Elise further suggests that a woman, irrespective of her lesbian or heterosexual leanings, wants an erotic fulfillment that does not necessarily lack in her replay of sensuous bodily contact that she experienced with her mother. Rejection of that or absolute unavailability of that posits a severe sense of wound and defeat for the woman that may reverberate experiences of castration for the woman. The clinical space for me often resonated narratives of women who, uh, who craved for tenderness, affection, sensuous lingering from men in their sexual relations, all leading to the woman's fantasy seeking sensual prolongings mingled with sexual erotic claims. Deep frustration in the yearning may perhaps set forth a reclaiming of the original sexual engagement with the maternal, prompting the woman to look for an easily available sociocultural guarded, guarded mechanism, appropriately creating a split in her object choice for eros, sensuous, emotional, and her object choice for the erotic, sensual, tactile. That way, it may offer her a functional fitting position within the larger heterosexual structure of society, which she has internalized to be a natural development flow, developmental flow of her female sexuality. Given the fact that women most often grow up in a familial environment with a lack of the semiotic flow in the diet, her larger quest in adult life may often continue to be a reinstatement of that plethora. In the Indian context in particular, a possible negotiating element for the woman regarding this conflict been between the semiotic diet, eros, and the semantic triad, erotic, both of which continue to be at play throughout one's sexual trajectory in life, is often played by maintaining a split between the two. She attempts to derive satisfaction of the two distinct qualities by often developing different attachments with two different object choices, namely the relational attachment eros with the woman and the sexual attachment erotic with the man. The first form of attachment being based on identification with the maternal, while the latter being based on differences with the phallus. And in this sense, the woman's engagement with bisexuality stands more pronounced in a sexual trajectory than other counterparts in society. Needless to say, this rift itself makes the very subjectivity of the woman a delicate, delicate conflictual, volatile ground to negotiate any self-agency. The exaltation of motherhood in the Indian society and the strong distinction of women divided between sexual object and love object for men's sexual choice all adds to the complexity of the woman's position in Indian society who gets torn between a Devi, 
goddess, worshipable, worshipable and a woman of flesh and blood, fuckable. Consequently, any assertion or claim of the woman's sexuality, which is pleasure-driven and not utility-driven, like motherhood and reproduction, may bring about a deep sense of an undue amount of guilt in the woman, as may be observed with lesbian choices. The burden of this guilt may leave the woman with an intense feeling of ambivalence towards her own body and sexuality, having lived years in a cultural negation of her body, all adding to its already existing oscillation. Subsequently, this negation of the body may indirectly encourage women into reinforced sacrificial masochistic positions, a transitional psychoerotic dynamism as their only form of sanctioned glory, pleasure by family and society, which is free of guilt. The quality of self-sacrifice in women in Indian families, inclusive of complete cleansing of sexual pleasure or any desire whatsoever, tends to become a cultural icon for cultural altruism for the woman. The quality of altruism falls prey to such familial societal compulsions to become pathological in its onset of its parasitic goal, which is solely vested on the woman of the family. All desires of any self-satisfactions are encouraged to be suppressed by family, society, culture, the outburst of which in the clinical setup may often bring about acute guilt and shame, self-loath within the individual, subsequently rendering the self rather unacceptable, which altogether may often shake grounds leading to nervous breakdown for the woman. In such situations, delicate areas of cognitive dissonance may even strike strong. Hence, analytic interventions need to be very patient in its prognostic speculations, while with limited psychodynamic psychotherapeutic engagement, it may often be challenging to even find suitable opportunity for such intervention or interpretation of the same. The maternal in continuum and the infantile. The persistence of social oppression and cultural insinuations often prompts the woman in India to seek her pleasure and satisfaction that usually does not follow a very direct pathway, inviting a more intricate, passive, tangled route towards its attainment. Desire and pleasure may not necessarily come in a direct manner for the Indian woman who dwells in inherent internalized conflicts between desire and guilt compounded with cultural morals. Motherhood in India may often hold promises of socially clandestine pleasures power and worth for the woman, while her sacrifices and morality hopes to find a glorified acknowledgement and position in family and society. The caring, the nurturing, the giving, the loving that comes with motherhood is perhaps that unique element of the feminine that finds respect in society through the marriage institution, which otherwise holds a painfully derogatory position for the feminine in family and society in the Indian context. Add to this, motherhood for the Indian woman may also act as a socio-cultural tool of resilience for her to fight for her respect, acceptance, physical entity, and dignity in family and society. Perhaps motherhood offers the balm to a cultural misogyny that rips apart women's dignity, leaving them with a deep Oedipal narcissistic injury. Thus, this may act as a catalyst in the woman's own internalization of her motherhood fantasy. This way, motherhood helps to continue with the woman's enthralling contribution of the body, a captivating somatic engagement to work with, to work out her life's angst, adding to the fraught narrative of the female body in love and labor in the familial space. The birth of a child in a woman's life may often bring in a temporarily playful space for the mother, which offers hope of indirect fulfillment from her psychic dullness and depression, thus bringing in an erratic sprout of life, the infant in her, that got smothered in her own childhood. This playful space is shared by both may be the point of instigation for nuances of a maternal infantilization of motherhood in the Indian context, with an unconscious hope of re recovering and lingering her own playful infantile celebration. This may equally act as a seductive insinuation in her own internalizational process, stimulating motherhood fantasies in her. 
and one is prompted to visualize this sprawling play of the infantile against the backdrop of a culture that harbors the idea of worshiping the maternal goddess, the all-encompassing all protective mother, while the rest remain her children forever. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yuma Bazak, for your paper. Very thought provoking. So now I will present Jana Horowitz Sandmeyer uh, for her presentation. She is PhD, is chair of the Contemporary Approaches of to Psychodynamic Psychotherapy Program and founding chair of the Sexual Diversity Task Force at the Institute for Contemporary Psychotherapy and Psychoanalysis in Washington, D.C. She is faculty and supervisor at the Washington School of Psychiatry and at the um, Institute for Contemporary Psychotherapy and Psychoanalysis. She is on the editorial boards of Psychoanalytic Inquiry and Psychoanalysis self and context and on the council of the international association of psychoanalytic self psychology dr sandmeyer was the winner of the 2018 ralph roten award from the committee on gender and sexuality of the american psychoanalytical association she is a psychoanalytic candidate at the national institute of the psychotherapies in new york city and Dr. Sandmeyer is in private practice in Washington, D.C. Jana will present her paper from her work entitled Accounting for Gender in Contemporary Psychoanalysis that was published on Psychoanalysis Self and Context. So, Jana, I give you the floor. Thank you, Monica. Um, I want to start by thanking Mariana for inviting me to participate in this panel um, and to Monica and Juma for and um, Santina for the warm welcome to IPA. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I would like to start by locating myself both geographically and culturally because I believe that we are all formed and informed by the interpenetration of our individual subjective experience and the cultural, geographical, and sociopolitical surround in which we live. I am in Washington, DC, and I'm a white Jewish cisgender woman, meaning I identify as the gender I was assigned at birth. I grew up in a family with a strong mother who had a voice and perspective equal to and welcomed by my father, and both parents in support of strong career women and making no secret of their desire for me to marry and have children. I also live in a patriarchal society here in the United States, which has been dominated by white Christian men since its inception, where anyone who is not a white Christian cisgendered man is under attack in various ways and to various degrees. It is within the oppressive reality of this larger sociopolitical context that I engage with psychoanalysis and my psychoanalytic community, and in which I formed and am still forming my psychoanalytic identity. Mariana invited me here based on a 2020 article entitled Accounting for Gender and Psychoanalysis, in which I describe my experience of egalitarianism. In that article, I was responding to a presentation by Virginia Terhar that was arguing that psychoanalysis has been and continues to be dominated by male subjectivity. Without reflection on the implications of the maleness of the theorists and the particular lens through which they theorize, resulting in an absence of theorizing female subjectivity. This entails an unexamined reliance on thinking and reason and the view that we should be able to think our way out of problems. And that evoked to my mind, the classical reliance on interpretation as the golden ticket to cure. The belief that with correct interpretations, patients will attain insight and accordingly rationally be able to change their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. I entered the psychoanalytic world, or I should say my particular psychoanalytic world, in the early 2000s at an independent institute that embraced relational psychoanalysis. 
relational in two senses of the term. The first is in object relational and self-psychological theories that rest on the premise that patients arrive in treatment with developmental deficits that come alive in the transference. And these developmental needs are met by the analyst within the analytic relationship. This model to which I was initially exposed is a deficit model. I'm thinking here primarily of Winnicott and Cohut and entails a change in conception of the analyst's role from neutral information giver to the provider of emotional experience within the context of relationship. In a sense, a shift from the analyst as rational imparter of truth and knower to analyst as nurturing caregiver. This shift from a classical focus on sexual and aggressive drives to an emphasis on the maternal analyst who provides developmental experience also to some extent desexualized psychoanalysis and desexualized female analysts in particular. And I think there's lots more we can discuss here about what we mean by maternal, what that signifies, and what it might mean for the analyst and their gender identity and experience, and also the implications of and impact of desexualizing the female analyst. With regard to gendered subjectivity of the theorist, we can wonder about these men's, in this case, I'm thinking Winnicott and Coet's interest in the maternal and how their own gender identities impacted their theorizing. And I raise this not to necessarily answer that question, but to raise it as a question that it's not an assumption that their theories are gender neutral, they're gendered theories by virtue of their maleness. The second sense of the term relational relational psychoanalysis is a sensibility marked by the relational turn in the 1980s. The relational turn in essence, to my mind, is the recognition of the analyst subjectivity as a core ingredient in the analytic situation. In this framework, the analyst is no longer a blank screen, but rather an active participant in the process in which both patient and analyst function as subject and object in a mutual but asymmetrical dance. Relational psychoanalysis is not a comprehensive theory of development in psychopathology. At its inception, all relational theorists came to this sensibility having been trained in other theories and largely influenced by feminist writers and thinkers. As such, it begins with multiplicity, with multiple viewpoints, open to analysts who bring object relations, interpersonal attachment, self-psychological, Freudian ego, and other theories to bear and increasingly scholarship focusing on cultural, political, and social embeddedness. The origin story is one of diverse viewpoints and contributions. What holds this big tent together is an abiding belief in the importance of the analyst subjectivity in understanding and theorizing psychoanalytic praxis. This is a sensibility that embraces the subjectivity of the two participants, the analytic pair, and interests itself in mutuality. The analyst is participant and analytic subject. Although the analyst has some authority, certainly in terms of setting the frame and structure, she is not authoritarian. So what do I mean by this? I mean that the analyst does not have claim to the truth about herself, the patient, or the situation. And as Racker said in 1957, the first distortion of truth in the myth of the analytic situation is that analysis is an interaction between a sick person and a healthy one. The truth is that it is an interaction between two personalities. A relational sensibility finds its roots in Sandro Ferenzi, who in his Confusion of Tongues paper in 1932, articulated that our patients see things in us that we sometimes are not willing or able to see in ourselves. Our patients know things about us, things we need to consider and take seriously. Neither patient nor analyst has claimed to the truth, but together in a collaborative process, they are co-travelers on a journey that involves them both, but of course is focused on the patient. In this model, the psychoanalytic patriarchy is dismantled. And at times the therapist will fail the patient and need to own their own limitations by way of offering a new relational experience. This is what is mutative in analysis. So now why am I describing all of this? <clears throat> is to set the context for my psyche. 
and for my development as a therapist. I believe it's critical to have a sense of where a theorist is coming from, or in our case, a webinar speaker, to be able to contextualize what they are saying. So you see, I came into my professional being in a psychoanalysis that was nestled in a relational context, both one that privileged the maternal function and an egalitarian sensibility. While I recognize the male dominance and patriarchy in psychoanalytic history and culture, the dominance I experience in psychoanalytic culture at present, I think stems from, not from theory, the psychoanalytic theory so much, as from the seepage, from the um, cultural and sociopolitical surround into the psychoanalytic, social and institution um, and clinical situation. I have been strongly influenced by women theorists writing about authenticity, empathy, subjectivity, trauma, intimacy, and relationship. Most notably, but not exclusively, Cara Marotta, Darlene Ehrenberg, Jody Davies, Hazel Ip, Donna Orange, Adrian Harris, and Shelley Doctors, among others. These smart, strong, powerful, nuanced, astute, bold, authentic, sensitive women have shaped my personal psychoanalytic development. I was not raised psychoanalytically in an environment that privileged interpretation and the rational. I was born into a contemporary relational world that incorporated feminist psychoanalytic critique and a focus on affective experience. As such, I populated my psychoanalytic world with the aforementioned women, in addition to other self-psychology, intersubjectives, intersubjective systems, and relational thinkers. In addition, women in leadership positions in my institute and the International Association for Psychoanalytic Self-Psychology and the International Association for Relational Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy, IARC, took me under their wing and supported me. Also critical in this equation has been the support of men in established positions who were curious about my subjectivity and encouraged me to find my voice. It was in the context of these meaningful relationships with both men and women, as well as gender non-binary and trans people, that my subjective voice came into being. And no doubt, my early family context set the stage for me to imagine the world was one of welcome, where men and women and people of all genders would take me seriously and that my voice mattered. In this context, I'm alert to the reality that many of my female non-binary trans patients do not feel the same way and have not had the same experience and have grown up in familial and cultural contexts that have devalued and silenced their subjective experiences. My, sub my subjectivity came into being in the context of mutuality within and across genders. I'm aware that I'm the beneficiary of the aforementioned women theorists, as well as others who boldly challenged and continue to challenge the male dominated psychoanalytic establishment so that I now can step forward. And I must say, however, and importantly, that I have been to psychoanalytic meetings that are dominated by men where women are silenced and have been silenced and I've had that experience myself, although fairly rare that I have. In this regard, I wanted to make clear that I'm not saying that sexism or male dominance in psychoanalysis is unproblematic or non-existent. Finally, I wanna raise another issue for consideration, which is the tension between universals and particulars. We need to be able to hold the notion that there may be or are similarities in women's gendered experience, but the meat of the analytic encounter rests on the meanings of that gendered experience for the individual, specifically the individual and their particular context and the specific relationship with the analyst. And as we know, context and subjectivities change throughout a lifetime. So now let me complicate matters even more and raise the question of operationalizing gender and gender identity. When we talk about woman, what do we mean? Are we speaking of a person who was born with a vagina, who identifies as a woman throughout her lifetime, a cisgender woman? Or how about a person who is born with a penis and has a persistent interoceptive sense of being a woman? What about tomboys? So you see where I'm headed with this as we complicate matters, binary notions of gender and normative paradigms of gender identity start to break down. And still, I would say this fluidity and openness exists in tension with categories 
that are important for naming experience, both of domination and oppression, and speak to real experiences of both. And I think Juma does this beautifully in her talk. Um, so I wanna close with invoking Stephen Mitchell, sometimes called the father of American relational psychoanalysis, who illustrates a historical conundrum that is often raised when discussing sexuality and gender, the dichotomy of nature and nurture, or biology and constructivism. In his relational perspective, Mitchell sees biology and cultural constructions and dialectical tension, forever impacting and influencing each other. He accounts for our bodies that are embedded in our culture, highlighting the importance of both. He says, our bodies and our reproductive nature serve as powerful constraints on what culture can make of us. And yet they cannot speak to us directly unmediated by culture. Biological and constructivist, constructivist models of gender do not so much demand a choice as create a helpful tension that perpetually generates new forms of organizing experience, a kind of potential space that is particularly well suited to the analytic process in its continual reworking of past and present, fantasy and actuality, internal and external to generate new meanings. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. It was a very interesting reading. And now we get to the Q&A section and the discussion, of course. I will ask and invite our two panelists to discuss their papers between them. And I will join you, of course. And uh, in the meantime, we will collect the questions using, uh, please, so if you want to make any question, you can use the Q&A box on your Zoom bar in the bottom of the screen. And uh, we will uh, try to answer to all the questions you, you, you will send. So, so it was very interesting to listening to you. I was very uh, much captured by the um, description that you, Ma, you made about your the traditional Indian context society. You describe the process of women's separation and individuation as hindered and restrained by culture that promotes for women a condition of sort of undifferentiation, as I am in my understanding. So inducing them to identify and to uh, stereotype or sort of a sacrificial woman, the sexualized woman too, who gives up the independence, ambitions and personal growth maybe uh, for the benefit of a dream of a traditional, for the traditional family. So this uh, something that, um, um, uh, stroke me and found some um, something in common also with uh, in some point of Jana's presentation. That was my, my question just to break the ice. So uh, Jana criticizes the, the, sex, the sexualization of women and female analysts. So um, if I understand correctly, you say that um, th this, this sexualization originates from the devaluation and isolation of female psychoanalytical thought, if I understand correctly. And from this perspective, Jana criticizes the thinking directed toward women by psychoanalysts of the last century, who place the mother at the center of their discourse on infantile development, thereby creating a new desexualized analytic style in which the analyst patient did represent a re-edition of the early mother-child relationship, which is very useful to understand many things. But maybe uh, I think I understand that you're saying that this cut out something very important. So my 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 question to you to both of you is if you want to 
say something more about this and how um, uh, this sort of a splitting between uh, um, tenderness, motherhood, which are uh, aspects of, uh, of the feminine development, of course, but um, and the um, eroticism of the and the passion of the natural love, um, a sort of a splitting and what's in between or what should be in between or what, what do you think about this um, your two, from your two vertexes? Do you want to start? I, 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 uh, yes, I was wondering. I'll, I can start. I think okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I really like how Juma set this up in terms of a worshipable and fuckable woman and that dichotomy. I think that's kind of what we're talking about. And I do think there are parallels um, in a here in the US in a in a Christian sort of it to me it evokes like a Madonna whore kind of binary. Um, that and and so I'm talking about, I think with regard to the developmental deficit model is placing women, well analysts, but women analysts and the that we're talking about in a in this desexualized maternal worshipable Madonna, like stripped of their it's just a funny word, but stripped of their sexuality, um, that I find really limiting, and mm -hmm. and leaving out a whole aspect of experience of self and sexuality and womanhood and and clinical that set that that puts a whole aspect of clinical experience and the patient's experience of self and life out of the conversation. Well, I, I would like to respond to Monica, what you said is that um, uh, the, the struggle that a woman goes through in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, claiming her identity and independence is not necessarily coming out of a traditional family structure. We, I think it is uh, interesting to note, um, as much as India is uh, in a conflictual, modern, yet archaic locale, uh, the Indian family structures is also very modern, and yet uh, there is very archaic locale. So uh, when we say traditional families, we imagine a certain kind of uh, traditional families that we've all heard about and grown up with. But this, this is a very interesting, complex uh, uh, locale of very modern, uh, well-educated mm -hmm. uh, families uh, who seem very outwardly liberal, but at the same time can become very archaic in their thought patterns and expectation from the daughters of the families. Uh, so this is something I was, uh, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, explain further. And that's why the clinical space becomes very complex to deal with because it's not this or that. It is a combination of this and that. Mm -hmm. So uh, to be, the choice does not necessarily mean um, that the woman is, uh, to you know, rule herself out of the family structure and society, and mm -hmm. have a, a completely solely independent entity in existence, because it entails so many other factors of isolation, of guilt, um, mm -hmm. of uh, not finding enough uh, alternatives to hold on to to counter this kind of uh, oppression, which comes uh, so heavily with culture and na the nation. It's not just uh, at an individual level in the individual family. So just wanted to clarify a little bit on that. It makes me think about um, patients I've seen here who are first generation Indian um, American women and caught in um, maybe it's similar to what you're talking about but like so in this country with immigrant parents who hold i think that in the way you're describing traditional indian values and gendered ideals and 
the patients I've had who um, are kind are caught between this like negative Western influence mm -hmm. um, and their uh, deeply embedded love of their culture and their history and their family, and um, and the expectation. What I've seen is an expectation to um, be professionally very successful or be a doctor or in real high expectations, but also marry and have children and stay and take care of the parents and, um, and really conform to the parents' expectations, but also then with like this negative Western influence in a way be, you know, really grappling with this, how complicated it is to want to do something different or someone who's queer identified or doesn't want to get married or doesn't want to have children and, and very deep conflicts about wanting and not wanting um, unconscious, you know, ties and identifications that are important. And I think and it makes me curious about how, you know, about my role or how I'm experienced as representative of something different and how complicated that gets in terms of allegiances. And it, it really resonates with me that what you're describing, this the complexity of it. Yeah. Thank you, Yuma and Jana. Now we'll uh, tell you a few questions from the public. The first is for uh, Dr. Bazak. Could you say more on, about why uh, with the Indian women, um, why the Indian women has difficulty having a symbiotic experience with the, their baby? Okay, I'll try to respond to that. Um, uh, firstly, the symbiotic uh, experience, the difficulty, that you have pointed out and I have talked about uh, is primarily uh, keeping the girl child in mind. It is a very different reaction when it's a boy child in the family. Uh, so with the girl child in the family, the pressure of um, uh, not having a boy child is still very powerful in family structures and in Indian uh, requirement of a successful mother, a successful, happy family, proud family when they have uh, boy ch children. So I was writing thinking in terms of the girl child. That's a social aspect, but it has this very strong impact on the psyche. And in terms of... Uh, the rearing practice, I would say that uh, there are a lot of um, expectations uh, that the mother also holds for the child, especially with the girl child, where the girl child would almost become an ally in understanding what um, what the mother undergoes in the family structure in terms of bringing in terms of giving birth to a girl child, other than also the family expectations and all of that. So it's like a, it's, it's like a, a control. Um, it's like a, a right over, over the girl child to perhaps understand the mother's trajectory in, in the entire family. Uh, that creates a huge amount of conflictual, um, ambivalent interactions, ambivalent space for the mother towards the girl child. Um, there is internalization of the familial um, treatment of the girl child as well. And that has its own impact between the mother-daughter relationship. Um, and bodily speaking, I would say that uh, there is an unconscious rejection, an unconscious uh, hatred towards bringing out a girl child uh, against this kind of expectation from family and society, and which creates a very strong impact on the relationship itself, um, creating further dissonance in the 
daughter's um, identity, bodily reactions, sexuality, as I was trying to talk about uh, from from uh, from uh, sorry, I was quoting Daniel uh, Diane L. Ellis on that. So that's that's how I would like to respond. Thank you, Yuma. And I, I have a, now a question for Jan, I think. Um, how can the analytic relationship help the analyst to understand or at least recognize the subjectivity of the other and how this subjectivity has arrived to a meaning of a certain experience like processes of gender transition? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think, I guess what comes to my mind in this moment about it is, is a real openness on the part of the analyst to hear the complexities of the patient's experience of, in this case, we're talking about gender. Um, and I, the way in my mind it it comes about is is really like broadening, broadening access to various dimensions of gendered experience. So even in the way that we're talking about from early infantile experience of of sexuality and sensuality to identifications with gendered aspects of experience or father, mother, two parents. Um, so those may be unconscious aspects of gender experience that may come into being or become formulated in the context of the analysis. I think for me, sort of letting go or loosening ideas about categories is helpful in thinking about um, trans experience or non-binary experience, or gender nonconformity. I think an openness to what society might be telling us about gender, and I'm thinking about in the U.S. where um, you know reproductive rights are under attack, so and women um, are devalued in ways. I mean, there there are ways. I think the U.S. and and what Jim is describing in India are, are actually quite similar um, in terms of the misogyny. And so, how might cultural misogyny be playing into gendered experience? So I think. A lot of it has to do with really giving space to the patient's subjective experience. And then also, if I go back to sort of my roots in self-psychology, like a real empathic immersion in what the patient's experience is and what they know about it, um, and giving wide berth for all of that to come into the conversation, I think is really important in, in helping a patient formulate a, a sense of, a subjective sense of gender. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jana. And now um, I have a question for Dr. Bazek or Yuma. Um, a participant asked, I just wonder if the process of negation of body is specific to a part religion or common in the Indian scenario. So I think uh, the, the question is whether this negation of body is informed by culture and religion rather be something more uh, deep, uh, so something more relational. Uh, I, I would tend to think, of course, it is related to um, religion uh, definitely because the indian religion practices emphasizes the soul uh, over the body and uh, i would like to think of course this is my thinking and i would like to think that this um, religious um, 
highlight of, of uh, the emphasis, the propaganda of the soul over the body, has also uh, its political grounding, uh, taking the fact that India has been uh, socioeconomically in such a position of poverty where the body itself is in, uh, in question of being alive. So it's like, a, uh, I would tend to see as a counterbalance to a very, very um, realistic um, expulsion of the body. Um, and in terms of negation of the body in the cultural sphere, uh, I do think it is primarily also something very, very um, specific for the woman, starting with, uh, let's say, in the child rearing practice of, of playing, playing which is uh, completely um, bodily and bodily active playing, which is uh, encouraged for boys, which is not uh, so much um, highlighted, encouraged appreciated for women at all. It's like women's bodies need to be covered, need to be um, uh, are always within a certain confinement, whereas women, uh, men's bodies are open out in the field playing in, uh, in, in, you know, football, which is very popular in India. So uh, this aspect of uh, growing up in a cultural context of uh, being ashamed of your body, in, which also includes the um, sense of dirt through menstruation that uh, uh, gets internalized by, by the woman. All of this creates a cultural situation where the negation of the body is very powerful for the woman. Thank you, Yuma. Now, uh, the next question uh, is for Jana. Um, a participant asks, uh, do you believe that the male predominance on the theoretical perspectives in psychoanalysis have been an obstacle for the consideration of feminine subjectivity and psychosexual development? Yeah, it's an interesting question to me, I think, because as I was doing this, I became so aware of what I think might be a kind of like provincial psychoanalysis that I have, or because I wasn't classically trained. So I think what I'm saying is that in like in my exposure and entry into psychoanalytic thought, it wasn't something where I had to like overcome this the more patriarchal, phallic male dominated analyst as author authoritarian authority truth teller rational and part like that that sort of framework i do feel can thwart women's psychosexual development and i think it can and and i in my experience of it coming from this more relational perspective that has an egalitarian collaborative i mean you you could there are ways you could say that's a more female maternal or feminine way of being is more collaborative. It, it makes you think of us talking to a colleague, male colleague analyst who we were talking about writing. And whenever I write a paper, I always send it around to my colleague friends to give me feedback and like look at it and we talk. And, and he was saying, why do you do that? Why don't you just write what you think or something? And I, and I, and my take on it was, well, it's better if I involve more people, more heads on this idea are better than one, and I can be in collaboration, in conversation. And when he and I were talking about it, we thought maybe there's a gendered aspect to that, um, involving people. So I think this, this my, my coming into psychoanalysis post-relational turn and not being classically trained in a way, um, so, so my entry point is different. So I think historically, yes, psychoanalysis has done that and, and, and really put women and, and also people of all different, you know, genders and, and object choice and all that put them down. Um, but I think through, through a different sort of analytic lens, it doesn't have to be 
that way. And, and I think also in terms of what Juma is talking about, because like I, what I'm imagining, I don't know, Juma, how you think or feel about this, but an Indian woman entering your clinic is going to have a different experience, I think, of her gendered self sitting with you because of all these things you're calling into question than someone who is not questioning these things and not coming from your perspective that you, your thinking and theorizing on this changes something in that person by her being with you, I think. Mm -hmm. I think what Jana just said, um, it's true. Um, I definitely agree with you on that, that uh, the socio-political cultural environment that we come with uh, in, in, in the clinical space has this uh, impact on our patients as much as their socio-political cultural um, space uh, experience that they come with. And it's varied in the Indian, let's say, class division, it's varied. So it's a constant learning that uh, we we are engaged with. I actually quite liked so what you wrote here about the developmental deficit that uh, patients come here with and how you related that um, to um, possibly the developmental deficit that uh, we undergo in, in the and our analyst analyze and model. Uh, I I quite like uh, the way you are in a way untying the tongues of uh, contemporary relationships uh, through your reference of uh, confusion of tongues. Quite really enjoyed that. Um, now I have a question for Jana, but also maybe Yuma, you can say what you think about this. How do, the, do you imagine the future of psychoanalysis as a theory and clinic, clinical practice related to the new advances in terms of gender? Big question. How do I envision it? <laughs> How do I envision the future of psychoanalysis? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think what's happening, one thing that I'm becoming aware of also as we talk, or you know, that's really coming to mind, is even in the US, how where, where a person is geographically makes a big difference. So I live in a, you know, in the around the nation's capital in a big urban center on the East Coast. It's a fairly liberal place. Um, and so the coasts of the US are pretty liberal. The center is not as much. And, and so I, it makes me think of the, when my colleagues and I talk about the next generation in like, so I have a, a daughter in college and a son in high school and the way they talk about gender and their gendered experience is so, and that of their friends is so much more fluid and open and they don't feel a need to pinpoint and categorize as, as much. And, and so, I imagine if psychoanalysis takes a cue that it will be quite open and fluid around here, maybe, I'm not sure, um, because we're also living in, you know, in the broader political context, a very polarized situation and the, um, and politically, um, <clears throat> gender affirming care and trans rights are really under attack. So it, it's really, this is a very divided country right now. It's very, and it's pretty divided. So, so I think when I look at, you know, younger generation, I see all of this um, openness and complexity and fluidity um, that's possible. At the same time, I think there are ways that, that um, as I was saying in my talk, like that, that naming, and saying this happens to this has happened to women, men have done this to women, is also important to hold. So I think so. I see these things in tension, and um, 
and and I think there's also a tension between essentialist sort of gendered experience and interoceptive sense of being of, of gender in inside oneself, a gendered self. Tensions between that and what culture makes of us gender wise. So I guess maybe, maybe I'm saying the future of psychoanalysis, if I were to say, is is one of multiple tensions <clears throat> between universals and particulars and recognizing the cultural context seeping in profoundly in ways that have not been recognized. And then also thinking about the individual in context. So maybe I'm gonna go with tensions. <laughs> this is my short answer. Mm. Oh, I was wondering if I could start and end with a short answer like you, would, you said. <laughs> and I would say that uh, the future of psychoanalysis uh, uh, future of psychoanalysis uh, lies uh, in the pathway of conflicts. <laughs> uh, but if I would like to elaborate, I think it's a huge learning that psychoanalysis uh, is undergoing, must undergo, in terms of um, uh, expanding its understanding of the gender um, revolution. And I think to be able to do that, it is not enough to look only into our psychoanalytic discourses, but to open up to multidisciplinary approaches where they have been in, engaged with this understanding um, significantly at times uh, much more than the analytic engagement has been. Uh, so I, I think that also opens up the scope of uh, varied thinking processes, many different kinds of questions, which will provoke, I mean, that's how uh, thoughts generate, which will provoke our thinking. And in the process, which is very actually, um, uh, is apprehensive, there might be many errors and mistakes which are not desirable at all, but any new uh, learning uh, apprehends that position. So we, we do have to look at the possibility of uh, not making that mistake because the clinical space uh, is not where we, we come with this uh, uh, I would say uh, deficit, uh, de developmental deficit uh, mechanism. But often it happens. And I think uh, it is important that uh, we acknowledge it within ourselves and before we go into the clinical room, which gives us the possibility of learning more from others uh, who are working on the same uh, concerns with the same concerns but through different pathways, maybe. Yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. Um, I have um, one more question. And well, actually we do have some, some more time to reply to the questions. Um, so uh, a participant asked, how do you explain the rise of authoritarian authoritarianism in India and America? Does this have anything to do with the female struggle against patriarchy? Could you could you come again once more, please, Monica? I couldn't sure. Quite get the question. Sure. The question is, how do you explain the rise of oh, how authoritarianisms in India and United States, and of course, does this have anything to do with the female struggle against patriarchy? Um, so I think they want to see if there is a link between authoritarianism and um, this uh, struggle. Well, uh, in the Indian family situation, one is born in an authoritarian 
environment uh, with uh, the head of the father, uh, head of the family being the father and uh, <clears throat> all norms conducted, preceded by that. And you grow up with that. And there is an outer culture where uh, the patriarchal uh, expectations of a woman's behavior, um, choice of work, all of that is determined. Um, I think um, it is it is very obvious in a way that when one grows up with that kind of a very um, very strict, guarded, uh, yet deceptively protective um, environment for the woman, one doesn't find that agency to be able to articulate most of the time. And we also come from a culture independent of whether it's uh, uh, the man or the woman uh, and the other. We, we grew up with a culture where uh, articulation is not really appreciated so much. Questioning is not really appreciated at mu so much. In terms of humility, one, uh, one is quieter, softer. Of course, it's changing. And there also comes a time when there is a rebellious outbreak by uh, the uh, teen teenagers of the family. But this is the this is the environment, the larger environment that one grows up with, and thus the struggle, the the constant conflict to break through this becomes a very dominant aspect of one's life and personality, uh, which can have uh, its own counter impact of uh, a defiance quality, which sometimes comes in an undue nature in unexpected situations where perhaps the situation is not even provoking that. So it's interesting to be able to see uh, how this is, this element of authoritarianism works, where there is a, a tremendous amount of fear with awe, not only just fear, with awe, that you look up to the head of the family, that you look up to God. You're extremely fearful of the God, and yet at the same time, you, you are uh, looking up to God for mercy, for prayers, for blessings. So this, this, this would be my response in a way. I think <clears throat> the way I would put it here, maybe a way I've thought about it is that the authoritarian position is, is a fearful one, is a defensive one. And that how I was saying in the sort of in the beginning of my talk about if, if you're not a white cisgender Christian man, right? Pretty much every other group in this country, I think, is under varying degrees of attack, depending on how you're kind of situated and located um, with regard to intersectionality and marginality. And so I do think gender is a part of that um, in the way that the person you know, in the authoritarian position sort of projects into the marginalized people, those aspects, those like loathsome aspects of self and then attacks them. And so um, I think sometimes it, it could be, or you could think of it as, um, you know, putting into those groups of people, women in this case we're talking about, or, or um, gender non-conforming people that hated aspects of self and then are projected in and then attacked. And so I think gender is, or, or the situation or position of women in this culture is a part of that, is a part of a phenomenon of that bigger picture. So not the, the authoritarian situation, I wouldn't say is solely um, in a gendered arena, but that gender and, and women um, play a part in that. But certainly I think, you know, uh, the threat that people see in gender nonconformity or trans situation in this country, it's like, I don't, I don't know, it's hard for me to get my, it's like, I don't get it, except in these sorts of terms um, about projection and hatred. Um, like what the big threat is, I don't see it so much, except as these sort of psychic processes.
Okay, so um, we are very close to the end of the webinar, so we can start our closing remarks. I want to thank you very much, Jana and uh, Yuma, uh, for being here for your very thought-provoking presentation and for the discussion of some very difficult questions also. <laughs> so I don't want to add uh, more contents or other questions to what you already said, but I would like to ask you if you wish to say something to close your presentation before we close the webinar. So please, Yuma, you can take the floor if you wish to say something more. Firstly, thank you, Monica, for this evening and for holding us through this. Um, in terms of a closing remark on my uh, presentation, I think I would like to emphasize the fact that I, I did discuss all the complexities involved in it. And with that, uh, what happens when one visits the clinical space. So the idea as a, a therapist, as an analyst, is not really for me to um, uh, it's not really a corrective measure that I cure them per se, because uh, the context of their uh, reality that they come with is far very complex and not not always uh, the corrective goal works most uh, easily and uh, it is more with the effort to understand that. Uh, it is difficult to work with such complex paradoxes, um, but it's more important to understand them, to be able to listen to what they are saying and to hold through it till the right time comes for um, a dialogue that can be uh, created with equal reception acceptance on both parts. Just wanted to emphasize on that bit. Thank you. Now, uh, Jana, would you like to close your presentation? Um, say a few words more. Sure. Well, I want to thank you for moderating, <laughs> um, and Juma for your your comments and your presentation. It, it's given me so much to think about, and I I think I've really been struck by the the sort of different perspectives we have, and also these overlaps, um, and commensurate sort of ideas and resonances between us and and also the differences I think there's so much to think about um I think psychoanalysis has so much to offer in terms of understanding these issues and and really helping people grapple with um the the internalized sense of gender and the surround and and I think Jim is right in in terms of looking toward other disciplines also to help us with this so when I think about what psychoanalysis has to offer in terms of the depth and the breadth of of living problems and living and access to more experience of ourselves and and in this in the way we're talking about the desexualization I would um, advocate for bringing back women's sexuality and the erotics into the clinical situation so we have so so we and our patients have access to what is such a fundamentally important um part of of living and relating okay thank you thank you jana for closing your your presentation now we are at the end of this webinar it was very very interesting and i want to thank you both again for being here and now i wish to uh, tell to all the participants that our upcoming webinar is going to be um, on uh, may 26 and the theme will be psychoanalysis and racism and um, I, as part of the IPA uh, communication uh, committee, 
I would like to uh, invite you all to participate at the next uh, IPA 53rd Congress in Cartagena, which will be uh, held from in July from the 26th to 29th of 2023, of course. Uh, so I hope you all enjoyed this uh, conversation on psychoanalysis and gender and um, and uh, welcome you to our next webinars. Thank you. <laughs>